Tonight we had some donuts, we had some 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 water, you know, and, um, some donuts, some water, some water with no napkins. <laughs> For all you don't know, it's in the hood over here, so we don't do that. We don't do that pants. So. actually fishing in the wrong pond. You need to be focusing your 
attention on those properties that are, come on, with me. Oh, yeah, absolutely. See, you get it. You get it. And so just be careful that you're not dealing with people that have property that's for sale. Be mindful. Be mindful that you're dealing with people that only have property that's on sale. I met Chris at something that I spoke at last month. And Chris said, yeah, man, I've been hearing about you, and I came up here to meet you. And people say that to me all the time. I'm like, okay, okay, okay. Then he's like, yeah, um, I own 30 houses in Lockwood. And for you guys who don't know what Lockwood is, it's a community uh, right on the outskirts of downtown, literally. Literally, it's um, in walking distance to the music factory. Um, could, be, could be the first neighborhood, depending on which way you leave downtown. So, um, it's prime, it's prime real estate. So, we were able to, to link up the next week or two, and I said, hey man, we gotta do something together, and I gotta do a meetup. Put the meetup out, and of course, uh, people, um, it, it, we, we ran out of space immediately. Everybody wanted to hear the story, okay? So, just, I'm, I'm on the outside looking in, I'm gonna hear his story, his full story for the first time myself tonight. So I'm on the outside looking in. However, I'm just so impressed that he is, he's not motivated by money at this point. He's not motivated by money at this point. Uh, you own 30 houses in any neighborhood outside of downtown. You can re pretty much retire. Um, however, he's not motivated by money. He wants to keep the neighborhood affordable. You know how the city talks about um, affordability, affordable housing crisis? Well, here's a guy who's actually out there doing that. He's doing just that. Like, he's literally doing more than the city. Like, by keeping the neighborhood affordable. If he did not own 30 houses, and I'm a builder, and we have a few builders in here, but if he didn't own 30 houses in that neighborhood, that neighborhood would easily be a six or $700,000 neighborhood. Now, normally what happens when it's a six or $700,000 neighborhood, what happens? Get pushed out in taxes, but we get pushed out, and then and from us getting pushed out, we just start complaining, complaining, complaining. Man, they did this, they, man. Ain't nobody do nothing to you. You have more than enough opportunity to buy a house. Your family rented in that neighborhood for three decades. Nobody said, "Let me buy this house." Okay, so gentrification is going to happen with or without us. But my man Chris, he was different. He seen opportunity in helping and helping his people. He wanted to go in and help his people. And what ha and what happens? I'm a building. I build half a million dollars in some of these neighborhoods that used to be hood. And these houses are five and six hundred thousand dollars now. And I'm I'm building these houses. And and sometimes the people and the renters they're looking at me strange. Like I'm not supposed to be there, even though I've been in Charlotte for eleven years and I. And I know a time, whereas in those particular neighborhoods and pockets, um, that you, you didn't see a white face in those neighborhoods at all. They, wouldn't, they didn't want to touch that stuff. Now fast forward, it's prime, it's prime real estate. So, I want everybody to put their hands together. If any malfunctions happen tonight, remember that. <laughs> the guru didn't spend the $800. So it's the guru's fault. So, my man, Chris Dennis. I want to definitely say thank you guys for, for inviting me out tonight because we do got legends in the room. Jay, I always followed you. Linda, thank you so much for helping out with loans in the beginning and the rear. Yeah. So, again, guys, let me tell you, God is good and he puts us in circles and places for a reason. But I'm going to talk a little bit tonight about tonight about three different areas. One, I'm going to tell you a little bit about community. And I'm going to tie that community in to telling you about my story. But in between my story, I want to tell you a little bit about hurt. And beyond the hurt, I want to talk a little bit more about community, but then I want to talk about gentrification. And then when I wrap that up, I want to talk about what is it you need to do and the right and responsibility that you have as investors, as wholesalers, and individuals that are holding properties. Because at the table, you have a right, but you also have an opportunity to give back. So I know. Now, that's a great job of introducing me, but I want to tell you a little bit before because success is not about what you intend, obtain in life, but it's about the things you go through and the people you help along the way. So my story started off with a lot of hurt, and I know a lot of people in the room tonight, you've never been through, you, you, 
you're not hurting. You've never sat there and seen someone steal your dreams or have dreams pass you by or look and say, I can't do it. You see, when I started in life, I was born with a learning disability. I was told that I would never learn past the seventh grade. They put me inside of a box called a resource class and told me for six years of my life that my learning ability would be capped at, seven, at the seventh grade. I know no one else can, can, no one here can know what I mean when I say it hurt like hell for someone to take your dreams and tell you what you can't become. I found myself in 2005 -ish, sitting in a corporate America, Bank of America cubicle that looked just like that resource class. You see, it had four walls, and outside of those four walls, I saw people who didn't look like me, and then some who did look like me living a life that I thought I wanted to live, but did not have the resources and access to get to. That resource class was happening all over again. Now let's talk a little bit about corporate America and sitting in corporate America. Now, I don't know how many of you tonight are in corporate America and don't know what true freedom is, but when I was sitting at Bank of America, I was in the six-figure category. I was almost at 185000 base salary, not including bonuses. But here's the hard reality I had to face every day. I was broke. I was making almost $200,000 a year, and I was broke. I tell you, I want to be real and raw with you tonight because anything that's possible means you got to go through something. And God will always set you up for a great destiny as long as you have faith and you believe it. Because in that cubicle, all I had was a whole bunch of, a whole lot of faith. Didn't have a whole lot of knowledge and didn't really know anything about real estate because I'll tell you, my journey did not start in wanting to get into real estate. I'm going to tell you a little story about what happened when I was in Bank of America, and I'm going to start moving on into how I got into the community. But one day we were at our, a board meeting at Bank of America, and I was leading the team because I ran the trading floor, the operations of the trading floor, so all the technology came through me. So when I was sitting in the meeting, my guys from New York decided to come down to visit Charlotte, little old Charlotte. And so I had to lead that meeting. And one day, uh, when, they, when they came to Charlotte, the airplane, the, the plane, I guess, was late. And the traffic was bad in Charlotte. They went up 85 and came down Grand Street. And when they came down Grand Street, they turned through a little neighborhood called Lockwood. Now, I'm going to pause for a second and tell you in 2000, in 2000, Lockwood, which is literally outside the gate over here, less than 500 feet from you, Lockwood was labeled as the top 25 most dangerous neighborhoods to live in America. <laughs> That's an article. Google it. Lockwood, 20, 2000, 2000, 2000, the top 25 most dangerous neighborhood to live in America. Now, I had just bought a house there. <laughs> Let that sink in. <laughs> now, fast forward. I'm back at Bank of America sitting at that table, and my bosses from New York walk in, and we all having, having what is called small talk, icebreakers. And, and, and they were talking about how they missed, the, the plane was late, they got traffic on 85, came down Grand Street, and drove through this neighborhood called Lockwood, and they were talking about how bad the crime was, and the, and the taxi driver told them, slide into the center of the seats because it's, it's dangerous. And they all did it. Now these guys from New York. And they were like, well, you thought crime in New York was bad, but look, I'm in Charlotte and I got nervous. <laughs> and so here, here's what happened. One of them turned to me, with an odd look on his face and said, where do you live? <laughs> I just bought a house in Lockwood. The same <laughs> <that Jesus talked. laughs> but here's the reality that happened to me that day. See, I went back to what was happening to me in resource classes. That neighborhood, myself, was living in a box. Something was broken. Because when I sat there, even though I was broke, they had money, I was broke. I was making money, I was broke. But I also saw something inside of me change because that community was 98% Afro-American. 99, there was one white guy. His name was Lane. One white guy. So 99% Afro-American. So what did that say to all my colleagues in the room? Because in the room, it was 99% Caucasian, 1% Afro-American. Let that sink in. It wasn't a race issue, it was a conscious issue that I saw a community that looked like me being labeled as the top 25 most dangerous neighborhoods to live in America. You see, I didn't get into real estate and start buying houses. I'll tell you, to this day, I've never done a we buy houses or, or a cold call. Don't even know how to do it. 
I told NASA last week, you're going to teach me something. I'm going to learn, I'm, I'm gonna learn from somebody. <laughs> but I never did. But what I did was, I went home that day. And I started, I, got my, I was in the process of getting my MBA at the time, and we were talking about charts and changes and how corporations and, and businesses start, and you've got to believe in yourself, believe something bigger than yourself. And that day when I did that, I went home and I realized what they would teach me in that MBA class was economics, and I had to make a change, and I wanted to do something that was greater than, than me, because I was, I was doing an impact at my job, but I wasn't making an impact at my job. I was doing an impact, I mean, I was making some of this money, but I wasn't building an impact in my community. So when I went back to my community, there were three ladies who had an HOA meeting. So the first meeting I went to, so now I moved to the neighborhood, this happened at Bank of America, and I went to a meeting, a neighborhood association meeting. When I sat in that meeting, there were three women, Ms. Kibler, Ms. Drakeford, and Ms. Ms. Le um, Ms. Laverne Sal Sal They were all there. And those three ladies told a story about how bad the neighborhood was and that they were so afraid to come outside so they bolted their windows down because they were afraid of the people on the inside breaking in. This sounds like a lot of community we're talking about today, right? Because we hear about all these communities we say are bad. Well, that's what those three ladies were talking about. But in my mind, something else clicked. How can three old ladies sit in the house with the windows bolted and the house catch on fire? My grandma, how can you get out? So now I want, I want you to start thinking consciously about something because again, when you sit at the table, you have the, you have the right to sit at the table, but you have the opportunity to make an impact and a change. Because I knew at that point, I didn't have a whole lot of money anymore, but I knew I could do something. So what I did was, came back with one little house I had, I said I wanted to do, well, let me stop for a second. I had, all, I, I lived in, I had a house prior, so I had two other houses I lived in, so I just got into buying houses. So I had my first house that was off of Monroe Road, and I bought the house next door to me, and then I bought a house in University. So this is my fourth house when I bought in Lockwood. And the only reason I bought it because I wanted to be close to my job downtown. So I just really got into buying houses again. I wasn't into really buying houses. I thought I would, I saw that somebody said you could buy real estate, let me try it. And I did. Faith works. Faith works. So now, I'm at the HOA meeting, I hear that story, it compelled me. And I said, what needs to happen? What's the, what's the psychological that's happening in this community? Drugs and crime and prostitution are high. They live as a bad community. But well, what is it bad? What, why is it bad? So you know what I did? Something that was innate. I went to one of the investors that was in the community. And I said, look, will you sell me one of your houses? The name was Charles. A lot of y'all might know Charles. And Charles had a different outlook on real estate. But she said, sure, I'll sell you a house. So I bought that house. And then when I bought the house, I said, well, I'm going to go ahead and renovate it and fix it up. Now, I'm standing in the front porch of the house on Bay Avenue, and I, I was in my corporate suit. You can't go in and live with the suit on. Don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> Don't try. Don't try. But I had heart because I was also in the military, so I knew, ta I, I knew tactical. I learned strategic at the bank, but I, I had tactical because I was in the military. Retired 23 years. Thanks to all my veterans and guys in the room. Thank you. So... When I bought the house in Charles, again, this was a bad, this was a neighborhood they labeled as a bad neighborhood. So we're in the house, I had my guys doing some sheetrock, and I was in the, in the, in the uh, I walked in with my suit on, I got everything organized, next thing I know, I hear pop, pop, pop. Like, what the heck is that? <laughs> <laughs> They're riding down the street, shooting in the air. Why? Why would you, in our communities, get in the car and think it's cool to ride down the street and shoot in the air? Now, I'm talking specifically about neighborhoods that you're, that you're looking at and working in. So I want to sink in about our communities. And I'm going to get to a, a point about communities in a few minutes because of how you can actually own and, uh, and control our neighborhoods. So what happened was, I said, that there's a drug problem and an issue here. So I actually went and said, let's do this. Let's figure out tactically where all the drug houses are. And that became my target. So I started buying drug houses. I wasn't here to com combat or compete or push a drug dealer out. But I was here to say, hey, look, I'm going to engage myself in this community. I'm going to start doing good in this community, and I'm going to set an example. And I'm going to tell you how that actually works. So I started a 5K at the music factory called the Average Change 5K, which is now, well, so at the time it was the NC Music Factory 5K, and now it's the Average Change 5K. It's a huge 5K. And we ran it through a community in 2005-ish. Now remember, a black community, a 5K, which minorities don't really run, running through 
a black community. Y'all ain't getting that. <laughs> <laughs> if them folks knew what they were running through, <laughs> they wouldn't <laughs> land. <laughs> but let me explain to you what happened. When it got back to the music factory, I said, remember, you didn't article said Lockwood was a top 25 most dangerous neighborhood. I said you just ran through that neighborhood. Thank you because now we've changed the perception and it's time to live the community. They couldn't, they couldn't refute it. They just ran through it. That was the start. So when we were raising money for the community, I went, I, the community said don't go to this particular house. And I was like, why not? And so the guy in the house had a felony. And so I said, no, I'm, I'm going. I'm going to ask them for money to help raise some money to do some stuff in the neighborhood. Because I don't, I, I don't care. It looks like we, we're people. We put our pants on the same way. But I'm going to show him respect. So I went, I went to his house and I said, look, we're doing a block party to try and get this neighborhood to become a community. Because again, I wasn't in the buying houses. I was in the building communities and changing lives. I wasn't in the buying houses. I was in the building communities and changing lives. I walked up to his door, and we stood there for a second. When he came to the door, he walked to the door, and a little guy walked beside him. Now, the little guy, when he walked beside him, he walked up, and he was like this. <laughs> and so I looked at him, and I said, the, 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 the guy was standing here, and the little boy was standing here, his chest poked out. I walked up to him, and I said, look, we're trying to do something great. <laughs> I need your help because we want to try and change the neighborhood and help these kids have a safe place to play and work with our seniors and do something great in the community. Will you give us some money to help out? <laughs> the largest amount of money I received was from the drug that year at the start of that event. Again, I wasn't there trying to push people out, but empower them because if you start doing something in our communities and they start seeing us do things in our community, our communities wouldn't get the labels that they get now. And that guy, when, you, when people ask me, when I say, that's not about the money for me, that same guy <coughs> came back to me a year later and said, do me a favor. Whatever you're doing, keep doing it. Because I'm about to go to federal prison, and I don't want my young nephew to end up like me. You see, that was my payback. So when someone tells me it's about the money, I tell you, you know, I, I get paid. I get paid by social, the things we do socially and the impact I have in the community. Donuts, yeah, some, some, some water, you know, and, um, some donuts, some water, some water, with no napkins. <laughs> For all you don't know, it's a hood over here, so we don't do that. Y'all don't have pants. So, with that being said, um, I had to spend money for this. Got the camera crew here. Uh, got some, some other expenses. I had to go rent 50 chairs. My man Aaron went to go grab that. So please, before you guys leave, just thank Aaron and his team for uh, sacrificing time to pick up some chairs for you. And so, therefore, I ran out of money and couldn't buy donuts or water. So, my man Sean McKay at um, American IRA. I knew, I, when I first got into the green side of real estate, I went to the RIA. I uh, joined the uh, Metro Line of Reading in town, and uh, me and Sean was about the same age. We were probably the youngest ones in the room at that time, and me and Sean were just talking uh, back and forth, and from we talking, um, we, we, we did a friendship, and the friendship, you know, all the way in 2019. So, I want to give my man Sean about a minute so he can uh, let you know uh, what he does and um, how, you know, you can get in touch with him with the IRA, because sometimes, right, what I do is um, I buy deals in my IRA, and I flip those deals tax-free. So what I'll do is I buy a vacant lot for, let's say, $1,000. Um, and I might sell that lot for $6,000, might sell it for $15,000. But I don't have to wait a year and a day for the lower tax consequence. I can sell it immediately. I can close on it, sell it immediately, sell it immediately and not pay any taxes because it's all in my retirement. And uh, what Sean does, Sean has different retirement products. So there's um, different rules and regulations to each type of product you get. And what I have is a 401k solo. So my last deal, I literally bought a, uh, some land on my street for $1,000. I didn't go to it. She won the 1000 I said, what can, you know, worst case scenario, what will happen? I end up selling it for like 9000 Okay? 
So I ended up selling that lot for uh, $9,000. It did take about six or seven months, but I got that money tax free. And that's just, you know, waiting for retirement. So Sean McKay, give a hand for my man Sean. <laughs> extremely brief. I'm just here, I appreciate Nasser, he's been a good friend, he's been a mentor to me. I've been more on the buy and hold side, watching him make a ton of money while I deal with tenants, so I'm not the brightest light in the world, but uh, I appreciate being here. Uh, as he said, our service is self-directed IRAs and 401ks, so basically you can use retirement accounts to buy rentals, to do wholesale deals, to do fix and flips. Basically, any of the things that you guys are out there doing, you can do in your retirement account. And as Nas said, it's a really tax efficient way to grow your wealth. And that's, that's certainly key to doing it um, as efficiently as possible. I'm here for you. I appreciate Nas. He's put us on uh, YouTube. He's put us on his uh, different uh, social media platforms. So you might have seen our stuff there. But I live in town, AmericanIRA.com. I got cards if you like. Uh, so just let me know if I can be a resource for you. Like I said, I'm just one of you. I'm just an investor here to learn tonight. So I appreciate it. Thanks so much for everything. So um, for those who live in Charlotte or surrounding areas, um, we have a special guest, a uh, really humble guy. Uh, I, I know some, some family members way back in the day, uh, some of the family members from way back in the day in my 20s when we was hitting Miami Memorial Day weekend. You know what I'm saying? So um, one day he seen me, um, I don't even know if he remember that, but he inboxed me um, and he said, yo man, this whole same thing work. And um, I'm like, yeah, I guess so. I just made 17,000, whatever I made that month, you know what I mean, this years ago. And came off kind of arrogant because he didn't have his picture in the photo. I didn't know who this guy was or whatever. I'm thinking somebody just, you know, yeah, whatever. I just didn't know who it was. Come to find out, of course, it's just my luck. He's doing a lot better in life than me. <laughs> so, um, that, I don't even know if he remembers that. But fortunately, he's a nice guy. He didn't curse me out or anything like that. And, you know, we became friends. And he has a seafood franchise here in the uh, Charlotte area. Uh, it's called Mr. Dreese. And Rod, if you could come up and do like a one minute commercial. You know what I mean? Thank you for coming out tonight. Nice cold stuff. Hey, what's going on, y'all? Um, yeah, my name is Rod, the owner of uh, Mr. Three Scrap Pot Seafood. Uh, we have uh, restaurants in Gastonia, Charlotte, um, and Rock Hill. Um, pretty much uh, started back in 2016 with the seafood, but anybody that know me, I tell them real estate. Real estate, real estate, that's it. Um, Met Nasa, bought a couple, a couple of properties from him. Um, shoot, he sold me property for like 4000 one time. He's like, you don't want this, you don't want it, I'm telling you. I'm like, nah, let me get it. He's like, Freddy Krueger house, I'm telling you. But, uh, you know, we buy, we buy anything, I'm telling you, I'm like, over 20 houses right now. But, yeah, that's pretty much how it started. Um, minor real estate, holding real estate, that's all we do. Well, I say we, me and my wife, that's it. We manage the restaurants, manage the real estate, everything. Like I said, wholesaling, that's this man right here. Thank you, Rod. Thank you for having me. Real good food, man. Yeah. Yeah. Take it smart. All right, so I know we all came. I know you came to hear these guys speak. So, um, therefore, um, what we're going to do, we're going to do a panel. Okay, so on this panel, we have Chris Jefferson uh, at Richmond, Virginia. Uh, Chris rehabs, uh, does new construction. His house is a lot nicer than mine, and he has a wholesaling business. He made his first seven figures in his 20s, okay? At 24, making seven figures. Now, I don't know about you, but if I had seven figures at 24, I would be in a Bentley Coupe, <laughs> all right? I would have 17 illegitimate children. <laughs> Living in my mother's basement. <laughs> That's me. But he didn't do that, so he was a lot smarter than me, obviously. And we got Max Maxwell, who 
started in this room, was living in his mom's house at 30, okay? And I told him this, like when I was coming up as a teenager, we had this joke as a teenager because we assumed that 30 was old, and we would say, man, you're gonna be broke, man, you're gonna be 30 and broke, or whatever. And so, um, I was 30 and broke. he was 30 and broke. <laughs> so, whatever, he, he didn't let that like condition his life. He didn't let his current circumstances define his life. And fast forward, we all know he has a seven-figure wholesale business, and he's doing very well for himself. So what we're gonna do, we're gonna do like a panel uh, format, and then we have Chris Dennis to my right. You can ask any of us some questions. Um, Chris just told his story about, you know, how he came up through the corporate ranks and ended up buying 30 houses in this particular neighborhood and keeping the neighborhood affordable, okay? All right, so um, if any of you guys have questions, um, you can raise your hand, questions about wholesaling, uh, some buying whole stuff, and yeah. I was gonna ask, um, I see you do demo machines, and I was gonna say, how do you actually create that into a whole system to volumize it and maximize it to you not know, have Uber drivers and Lyft drivers go out for you and look out for these properties? Um, so for everybody who knows, Deal Machine is an app um, that uh, my friend David created and essentially allows you to drive around and take pictures of property. When you take the pictures, you can send a postcard of that picture to the owner. It right. has all the information. Okay. Um, so that's what Deal Machine is. Um, how we scale that end of our business, we try def different ways. So my friends, the Polites, uh, Dedrick and uh, Crystal Polite, they, they pay per a usable submission. Right? So what they do is they go out and recruit people. Um, Uber drivers and Lyft drivers have meetings like these. Um, so you need to infiltrate those meetings. They have Facebook groups. Um, find people that drive on their day job for a living. Uh, postal workers, people like that. I went with a different route. I, uh, what I did was I, I, paid, I paid young people to drive $300, $350 a week um, to go out and capture at least uh, 100 good properties every single week. I don't care if they did it all in one day or they did it throughout the week, um, but if I if they do that correctly, I'm paying about three dollars per good lead. And if it takes them three months to find a deal, you know, what's three six was twelve times three, that's thirty six hundred, and my average deal size is thirteen three. So it makes total sense for me if they got if they takes them that long, right? So if you know your KPIs, you know where you can really spend your money. Right. So going out and finding people that drive in their day job. Or, you know, because it's hard for somebody to, to just do it per $2 submission, I think. Yeah. Um, so actually kind of employing these people as 1099s so that they go out and drive for you. And that's just one of our lead sources. Okay. So find people that want to drive and scale. Great. Appreciate it. Um, how many people here have not done a deal? Never done a deal. It's okay. I was here two years, so three years ago. Um, my, my biggest challenge now is I'm scaling. So... Um, and this probably wouldn't pertain to a lot of people because you haven't got your first deal, but with anybody that owns a business, even my man over there owns a restaurant, it's, it's finding employees. Uh, that is my biggest challenge every day. We spend thousands of dollars on Indeed, Zip, Zip Recruiter a month trying to find qualified people to work on our sales team, dispositions, and stuff like that. So that's, I think that's with, with, with anybody's business. Um, some of the biggest challenges I see uh, going around the country and speaking to new wholesalers is um, their mindset. It's the biggest thing that they, because everything on how to do wholesaling is online. Everything. This is why when I go somewhere and they pay me $25,000 to speak, I don't talk about wholesaling because it's all online. What I talk about is the correct mindset you need to begin a new journey and any journey with entrepreneurship. A lot of us have been taught things the wrong way our entire life, right? And so we have to undo that. And, and that starts with the basic stuff. So start to challenge your everyday thoughts that you have uh, so that you can actually go out and implement the things that Niles and Chris and everybody else online is telling you to do. The blueprint's there. You just don't have the mindset to read the blueprint. If you're not educated beyond the, the actual material to do it, you don't understand how to read the blueprint because your mind is not ready. So I would say that you need to do things differently than you do in everyday life. If you don't read, read a book. Niles reads 10, 10 pages of a book every single day, right? I'm dyslexic, so I listen to, to, to books, right? So I don't read that much. Um, but you, you have to do things that challenge the way you've been raised and brought up so that you can accept 
the, the, the responsibility that you're gonna be rich. It, it just, it's, it's, a, it's a great responsibility. And if you don't really believe that you're going in the right direction and in the path, if you don't believe that you can reach these successes of the people on the panel, then it doesn't matter what I tell you to do to get there. You're not even gonna believe it. You don't have the mindset of a champion. So that's the big thing. Let me jump in on, on mindset too. So like, who here is like a regular nine to five? All right, so like, let's just say the majority, right? The easy concept with this is have the same intent that you have to make sure you get to work on time yeah. with your job. So if you gotta be at work at eight o'clock in the morning, like you wake up with intent to make sure you're at work by eight o'clock. Most people don't get to their first deal because they have no intent. So you get off at five o'clock, you gotta go drive for dollars, you gotta do whatever you gotta do, but you don't do it with any type of intent. So if something comes up, uh, you know what, I'm not gonna work today. I'm not gonna do this, I'm not gonna do that. You're hurting your business every time that you do that. You have to have the same intent with your own personal business that you have when you go to work. My biggest challenge too is two things. I think you touched on it is, is finding employees, finding the right people who are hungry and really want to make it happen. And then second, as a as a wholesaler, you will eventually you may have to own owning a property. Taxes is one thing. If people talk about the properties I own, taxes huge part it can take away from your income. So being mindful of the markets and my biggest thing now is not being afraid to involve. I'm lending money, whole different world set, world set and mindset, and I'm doing commercial, different mindsets. So biggest factor in my business now is being able to not be afraid to involve. All right, so my business, uh, biggest challenge right now is we're just going through uh, different changes. So. For some of you know, I was doing a lot of rehabs and building in the last few years, so scaled all the way back. And me and one of my partners right now, one of my partners, DeAndre Front, and we actually are uh, working on a uh, 12 unit deal. Hopefully, she'll be closed this month, but uh, next month. But um, hopefully, yeah, thank you. But hopefully, we, um, I want our biggest challenge is just basically we're going to start just looking at other markets. Uh, past years, we've been able to dominate the, the markets right here, surrounding areas, and we're just going to go, you know, a little bit more farther out uh, right now, just to keep that uh, consistent uh, income coming in monthly. You know, we've been blessed the last few years, but you always want to prepare for the future, so we're just trying to prepare for the future. So it's just transitioning into a different business model. You, you never, like Jay said, when you're flipping houses and building houses, you're literally playing the game of uh, musical chairs. Somebody's gonna get caught holding something that they didn't want to hold, so you know, somebody, you know, is, somebody's not gonna get that last seat, put like that, so, you know, just wanna be more careful. What's the day-to-day -day look like, not in your world, in a beginner's world, what should we implement for a day-to-day -day strategy? I want to start with that because I think go back to mindset. I, 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 want to, well, I, I had to grab the mic on this because I'm going to tell you, <laughs> I have a, a three-step ritual. First, the first thing I give, I thank God. That's my first thought. It's say, good morning, Lord. And I don't say, Lord, good morning. I don't say, I say, good morning, Lord, because good morning, Lord, is thank you. Not, Lord, good morning. That's a complaint. Second thing is, the first 30 seconds you get up, you got to infuse your mind with positivity. I mean, I have challenges all day. Um, poor people make problems. Wealthy people solve problems. So you've got to be able to get your mind state early in the morning to be prepared to start solving problems. And the third thing is you got to be thankful for what you currently have. So I know that's a little bit off, but I want to, it's part of the mind state shift because if you're not thankful where you are, you can't be blessed on where you're going. So every day I wake up with those three things, and, and I'll text them out to you as well if you want me off the text last. But that's a major thing is find some video, find somebody to watch that can pour into you something positive because in your day when the things hit you, you don't want them to have to hit you and you're not ready for them. All right, so when I first found out about wholesaling, I was working a um, second shift job. I had four, uh, four tens is what they call it. Um, so I worked from 11.30 a.m. to 10 p.m. I had Tuesday and weekends off. So what I started to do was I stopped listening to music. You know, those people are already paid. They made their dreams work. I had to work on my dreams. So um, back in like 2010, uh, audio books were on CD at that time. So yeah, so um, I started doing that, listening to audio books. Sean, um, Sean Terry did have Filter Freedom, um, did have a podcast out. It was like five real estate 
podcast on iTunes at that time, and I had a, um, an adapter to my iPod that allowed me to play my uh, iPod the radio station. And I would listen to uh, Sean Terry's uh, podcast from, you know, going to work and as I, um, and coming from work, but as I changed jobs, um, my commute got longer. And so when my commute got longer, it took me about 35 minutes. So that's like an hour and 10 minutes of just listening in a certain positivity in my mind. So with the first job, I had Tuesday off. I would, do, I would go to this meeting where I would hear Jay speak, and a guy named Dan uh, speak every Tuesday. I would go to that meeting um, weekly, get the information, and do action steps. I would start doing things. Saturday and Sunday was no longer play, play days for me because I was at a place, I was 26 years old, and I'm like, man, I ain't go to college and work with no calls for the rest of my life. Yeah, this ain't me. You know, I ain't, uh, ain't no calls for that. So, yeah, for those who have never worked in a call center, be thankful. All right? Be very thankful because in that call center, like, I don't think I'm joking, but people was getting pulled out in stretchers. I seen, I seen guys or people come in with doctor notes that they couldn't work there no more. I had a doctor note because the stress levels were so insane. Yeah, like the, 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 the paramedic people had to come. And I'm like, damn. That's crazy. Hey, look, I, I worked in a call center for a long time, and I, I've seen the same stuff. So yeah. I'm like, I'm so, yeah. So, you know, I just said, like, man, this can't be my life. You know what I mean? Like, uh, you go to your job with a doctor's note, I can't work here no more. Can I go home now? You know what I mean? Like, so, first time I've seen that. But anyway, I would schedule lunchtime, I would do memos. Lunchtime, I pick up the phone, call people back. And never tell your job you're an entrepreneur. That does not work. I learned my lesson hard. Don't do that. Okay? Never tell your job. Yeah, yeah, quick. So, with that being said, um, then I got another job, which was a uh, 9 to 5. And lunchtime, same thing. Call the seller back. Uh, Monday and Wednesday, I would sit down. As soon as I get from work, uh, go to my bedroom, and it's call the seller, beat the phone up. So I just had to schedule my day better, but I did cut off cable for three years. Stop watching sports, stop watching, you know, just to make this business work. And I used to use my PTO time to go to uh, the RIA meetings, which were every third Thursdays. Like, I was dedicated to the journey. Like, I was comfortable with it because I knew the alternative. If I didn't do this, well, this is gonna be my life. No way in hell. So let me just go ahead and do this. You know, because it's just one of those situations, like, you know, I, I never want to look my kid in the eye and say, the reason why we didn't have shit is because daddy didn't try. All I had to do was try. So, you know, I just kept that mindset and kept it going. Pass this to Matt. Uh, Matt to um, a morning routine is important. Um, what I used to do when I first started is, at night, I would scour the internet for data. Um, so what I became, first of all, if, if you're just starting off, you need to pick something that you're going to be great at. I became very good at tax delinquent and uh, probates. So at night, I would scour all of those lists and skip trace at the same time, right? So that in the morning, when I wake up, I can make my phone calls from 9 to noon. And then I would go on appointments from noon to like 3. And then I'm back at the courthouse from that 3 to 5 to get more data that's only available on paper and do the same thing over and over again. What happens is now in this world, everybody's selling you something, a product. And these products work if you use them, but most people don't use them. So what I would do is I would start very basic and just go with pen and paper to the courthouse. You need to find something that you're gonna be good at. Be good at one lead source of something. You could be great at tired landlords. You say, how do you do that? Well, you go, to, you go to eviction court every single day they have it. And you go to eviction court and read the docket. And every day you're going to see people on that docket, plaintiff and defendant. Plaintiff is the person that owns the property, the defendant is the guy that's getting kicked out. And that, that person, they're, they're at the lowest. When you're, the, when you're evicting people in North Carolina, you're usually 30 to 60 days with no rent, depending how the process went. You spent money on an attorney to get, get the person out of there. But you need, you, you're hitting at the lowest problem. Remember we said, broke people create problems, rich people solve them. So you need to go in there and solve that person's problem of being maybe a tired landlord. Right? So just find something that you're going to be good at and then study the shit out of it. 
Like, I used to read state, I'm dyslexic, so reading state statute, which is lawyer talk, I had to figure out how the tax foreclosure process happened. And it couldn't deviate from that because it was a state statute. So if I learned that and then I went into the courthouse, I knew more than they knew, right? So then I knew the earliest point that a foreclosure was going to enter into the public record. And I would find it 90 days before he would find it. Because I, I found out what the first piece of paper that they had to file, what the actual real process was. So just getting, uh, getting obsessed with something, right? We've all been obsessed with things, good or bad. Be obsessed with something that's going to make you a lot of money. But find a daily routine. And I think everybody has a different answer of what it, a daily looks like. But pick yours and find it. If it doesn't work, change it. So I'm going to piggyback on that a little bit. All right, so I believe in a daily routine for sure. But what, what Max is really saying, too, is like know your time, right? Like you got to have a schedule. Like I believe in time blocking. So like be intentional. I talk about intent a lot. Like be intentional about how you put your time together. So I'm going to drive for dollars for two to th like from 2 p.m. to 3 p.m. I'm going to get on the dollar from 4 p.m. to 5 p.m. Like know what you want to do and do it. So this is my advice for daily tasks: talk to sellers every day, right? So like I talk to people who haven't done a deal yet, and they're like, "Oh, I've been doing this. Oh, I've been researching this. I've been on Bigger Pockets. I watch all Max's YouTube. Yada yada yada." My first question every single time: Have you talked to a seller yet? Yeah. You'd be surprised how many people say no. Right, you like you have to talk to sellers every day, even if you don't know what you're doing. Like fall forward, right? Like figure it out, fail forward, figure it out. Like have that conversation. You may not get that deal, then you just go to the next appointment. But continue to talk to sellers every day. Part of my morning routine. I started doing this a couple years ago. Um, I felt like I was just like waking up every day and just kind of doing whatever, right? So what I started doing is uh, I go on YouTube every single morning. I meditate in the mornings. And I go on YouTube and there's a, you type in like motivational videos in the search bar. And like all these videos come up with like this crazy music in the background and gets you pumped up for the day. So that's kind of part of my morning routine. I like to do that. Gets me motivated and ready to go. CJ, you said you're spending ten, twenty thousand dollars a month on marketing. Yeah. What are you spending it on? What kind that's of marketing question. are you spending yeah. it on? So right now we do a large volume of texting, all right? Okay. Uh, and cold calling primarily. All right. So um, yeah, I mean, I like texting a lot. A lot of people are starting to get into texting. Uh, so one thing I'm going to say on texting is, everybody says, hey, what's your opening message? I see that like in your group all the time, right? Hey, what's the opening message? Guys, don't make your opening message the same, all right? You want to ask a couple of things in your opening message. You want to identify the person you're trying to reach, all right? You want to identify yourself. You want to identify the property, and you want to ask a question. Your question. So, hi, Max. This is Chris. I just drove past the property at 123 Main Street. I was just curious, are you open to an offer? Oh, whoa, it sounds just like a phone call. Just like a phone call, right? And so now I'm putting the ball in Max's court. He's got to respond back to that. He's either going to say no, he's either going to say yes, or how the hell did you get my money? Right. right. And so, and so when they say that, like shift through that, but I like texting a lot to answer your question. I'm still big on cold calling, y'all. I like cold calling a lot. We've made a lot of money from cold calling. I see a lot of people saying that cold calling is getting difficult. There's a lot of people. You get less pickups. If there's less pickups, you increase your volume of calls. All right? So if the market has become more competitive, that's okay. That's just naturally going to happen. You have to increase the value of your calls. So if you're doing 500 calls a day, you got to start kicking that up to 1,000 calls a day and you just constantly change those metrics inside your business, and I guarantee you're gonna do more deals for sure. And, and also, I know a lot of people are going into text messaging, it's become real popular, and I know why a lot of newbies are doing it too, because you feel like you ain't gotta get on the phone and talk, right? Yeah. Don't use text messaging yet. Get your battle wounds, get, get your thick skin first, because guess where that text message is gonna end up? On the phone. Right, so if you ain't got, if you ain't got it down yet, don't do it. You're gonna blow, you're gonna waste everything. By going out there and actually do, doing it that way. You get what I'm saying? Yeah. Don't, don't have that fear of talking to people on the phone. I talk to like new wholesalers all the time and they're like, oh, I just don't like it on the phone. And don't be, like he's saying, don't become text message dependent, right? Like we, we got really, really good at cold calling before we ever touched texting. And people were talking about texting, telling us how great it was. We focused on making sure our cold calling systems were tight and that they could run on their own before we ever jumped into trying to do text messaging. So do not abandon calling. 
you're gonna end up on the phone anyway, like you said. And the person who wins that call, and I'm talking about we're all calling the same list, right? We're in the same market, we're calling the same people. So it's who can get somebody on the phone and make that conversion inside of that conversation. We have on the whiteboard in the office that says speed is life, right? So my goal, if I'm in your market, is to beat you to that conversation with the seller. If you're scared to get on the phone, I'm gonna get on the phone, my people are gonna get on the phone, I'm gonna make sure we close the deal. And not only that, I'm sorry, I know I gotta go that way sometimes. <laughs> not, not only that, I just like wholesale a lot. Not only that, but you have to do the follow-up. It's important, yeah. right? You may text or call that person once and you're done. Gain answer, done. I'm going, my team and my going to hit them six or seven times because you have to look at the window of opportunity. So let's take that same tired landlord we talked about in court, right? Three months ago, he wasn't interested, right? He ain't got rented. Well, he, he was getting rented at that yeah. point. And then you stop calling him. So three months later, I'm hitting him up. And guess what? Now he's at that point. So the window of opportunity is always moving, right? And rocks, stones are our marketing. So you're always throwing, and not every time you're gonna get through that window. But when that window finally lines up when you throw that stone, that's the point where you're gonna get to be able to solve a problem that they have. Right? So you gotta always be throwing stones. A lot of people just throw a stone and just wait, done. All right, forget it. He respond. So you gotta keep doing it, right? You just can't. I, a lot of people say, I just got a list, I text it, nobody respond, I need another list. No. <laughs> you need to try another way of contacting the person. Right, so, so for example, I use a conveyor belt method system in my, in my business, right? So if, if you, um, if I sent you a piece of mail, would you, who, how many people would open it up and read it? Raise your hand. It looks like nobody, so mail's not, well, we got one, so I'm gonna get her house, right? <laughs> Everybody else, I'm not gonna get anybody else, right? So if you get a call from an unknown number, who picks up? Raise your hand, right? So I'm gonna get y'all's house, great, okay? If you, if I send out a text message, how many people gonna read it? Raise your hand. I guess it's the rest of y'all house, right? So the point is, is everybody likes to be contacted and speak the way they want to be spoken to. You can't force it to make them pick up the phone. You can't force them to read your mail. You can't force them to read your text message. So if you're going to give up at that point, then you just might as well just not even start this business, right? If you can't handle that stuff, just come work for us, right? <laughs> we, need, we need to dedicate you. I'm serious, man, because, because it's, it's hard. I hire wholesalers to give up, so. Yeah, I mean, just, I really about when you do virtual, virtual deals, like you have another state, and you get a 7 on 7 in another state, how do you go about having that? I do virtual deals. I'm a, I'm a I'm take a note on that. Yeah, so there's a website called uh, wegolook.com, I believe it is. We. We, like W-E, golook.com. So you, you source your deal, however you source your deal in a different area, right? You can go on this website, you can pay somebody a fee, to go out to the appointment for you, take pictures of the property, and then kind of give you those properties back. And it's not, it's not expensive at all, right? So they'll bring those pictures back to you, and you can evaluate the deal uh, based on the photos. So like, that's what we do in our business. So you know, like, this year we went down to, I'm in Richmond, Virginia, so we went down to uh, the Hampton Roads area. So like Norfolk, Hampton, Newport News, Portsmouth, right? So like, I've got two deals in Portsmouth right now under contract. I've only seen them after we got them under contract. All right, so you send somebody out, you pay them a small fee to go out and take a look at the property. They bring those pictures back to you. You evaluate the deal based on the pictures. That's gonna take some time to get used to being able to do that, but just be intentional about trying to figure that out. And then you just do the exact same thing. You do the exact same process. If you don't know a title company, like you said, know your network. Reach out to somebody who's already in that area, right? Can you elaborate on title companies? Because I think that's important in my world. It can be a, 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 um, a break, a, a break deal for you, a break deal. <laughs> yeah, trust me, I know that for sure. All right, well, Good. all my people who live in North Carolina, in North Carolina, we use attorneys here. We're an attorney state. In other states, they might use a title company. So even if you're in, I'm in, I'm in Virginia, right? So you can use a title company or you can use an attorney. I've done both. I've only been screwed by a title company before uh, to the tune of a whole lot of money, all right? So we do every deal now through an attorney's office. Regardless if it costs a little bit more or not, you cannot replace the opportunity to get free legal advice when you go in for a closing. All right, if that attorney makes $325 an hour, and you can go sit down and pick his brain for half an hour at a closing, get answer some questions in your business, things of that nature, I'd rather pay a little bit more money and deal with an attorney 
then when an issue does come up, and they will in this business a lot, right? So when those issues come up, you've already got a relationship built with an attorney that's gonna step in and make sure they try to help you out with that situation. What was you guys' uh, biggest mistake that you guys made in your business career, and what did you learn from it? Not getting started sooner. I'm not saying that. And, and really just stop, just move fast. Yeah, and, that, and that's kind of, that, that plays along with any business, right? You listen to a lot of chatter, right? Stop listening to broke people, first of all. Yes. The number one, but like I said, this, I, when I said this early on, I said, get rid of all your friends. I'll be like, fire them. I mean, just stop hanging out with them for a little while and go, go hang out with people or do, do anything you need to do. Like if you want to hang out with this gentleman right here, I don't care if you got to wash his car. Right, because the knowledge and the mannerisms you're gonna pick up from being around him. If you want to be him, if you look at him and say, Yo, I, I want 30 hours, yeah, I want that. If you can, if you want to be him, be a go be hang around him, find do anything that you can do to be around that person. Um, and that 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 is what a lot of mistakes. Like we try to, and, and it's lonely being an entrepreneur, period. Right? Luckily, you, you, you have your wife in the business, right? But it's, it's just lonely being an entrepreneur because we're at the top one percent of all Americans, period. Right? So you just it's just a lonely journey. So you need to find be around people that that like in this group in this room here. Have meetups without him. Yeah. Like go to the coffee shop, y'all. Ten of y'all can meet at the coffee shop next to him. You know, it don't cost anything. Bounce ideas and stuff like that. So my biggest mistake was not starting sooner. All right, let me uh, just say something. I'm gonna just go off with uh, Max. Said. You go. I'm just going with Max. Said. So when I first got started and I still had a job, and uh, Jay didn't pretty much take me as a student. So I would have to be up under him as much as possible. And one of the things I had to do, he had me crawl under a house. <laughs> under the house. This one I had dreads too. I was, not, I was not prepared for this at all. Who's called for pets? We, okay. So, Jay was too cheap to go hire a real plumber. But why hire a plumber when you had me? So, the plan was, he would feed me the packs from the top of the house, and I would run it through the bottom. So here it is, I'm crawling under the house, and I got spider webs, everything in my house. I, I do not like spiders. I'm one of those people who grew up in the 90s, and the rap before being scared the shit out of me. <laughs> <laughs> so, I don't like spiders. Yeah. After right before me, I was done with spiders. Done. All right, so I'm under the house. I'm getting dirty. However, during the midst of that, I get to talk to him. I get access to him. And after that, I made him buy me lunch. Like, I made him. It was like, hey, you got to eat lunch, bro. You got paper. It's crazy. My hair was all dusty. I, you know, going to bed. But we got the job done. And that was the house I think he got for nothing down or barely let me down. And you know, I just wanted to be up under him and learn that information. So he dropped a good jewel. Um, you can get with Chris. Ask Chris, hey, you need free labor? You know, and just to get up under him and do, make sure you're adding value to them. You know, most importantly, I'm gonna let CJ go on with the question. I was gonna say a lot of what you guys already said, like, a lot of things come down to like, what's the value at? So any like player in your market, so if we're in Charlotte, right? And, any player in this market is going to have people constantly. Now, how many people hit you up a day about getting lunch? I used to be one of them. Uh, all the time, yeah. Right? yeah. A lot, right? I'm so, glad I would turn that down. <laughs> <laughs> so everybody's getting somebody saying, hey, can we go to lunch? Hey, can we do this? Hey, can we do that? Whatever, what they're saying is find ways to provide people value, right? I got my start in this business literally by finding somebody that I was introduced to, and I would go to his office. I used to work overnight with tractor trailer trucks. At 8.30 when I got off every single day, I went to this guy's office and I followed him around and did anything he asked me to do. If he had an issue with a tenant, I went and tried to go figure it out. If he had a contractor that he had an issue with, I went to go try to get it figured out. Whatever I could do to provide him value, right, I would do it for him. I never got paid one dime from this guy. He made a whole lot of money off my back. I never, I, a lot, a whole lot. This guy's super rich. All right, so I did all these things for him, but here's what happened. A couple years in, when I go to buy my first property, who do you think is my first private lender? He was, right? So I provided him value for years. Never asked him for a dollar. He didn't even give me lunch, right? <laughs> so I just, kept, I just kept giving the guy value, right? And so when I found the first deal, I actually went to sell him the deal. 
All right, so I'm trying to sell this guy the deal because I'm wholesaling. So I'm trying to get him the deal, and he says, why don't you buy it? Tell the guy, look, I don't even have any money. All right, I'm barely scared by even trying to wholesale. So he says to me, hey, I'll fund the deal for you because nobody like me cares about anything other than can you make me money on my money or not? So he said, can you do that? And I said, yeah, I've already been doing that. I just haven't charged you yet. All right? <laughs> so what did he do? He said, I'll fund the deal for you. Let's flip it. We'll split it 50-50. That all came, just like these gentlemen said, from just providing value. All right, so figure out how you can give value to other people when you want to be in their space. And that's, that's so true. My mentee just left Rob the day he was up in the house today. Um, my mentee today was here earlier. He was up in the house from up in the house today. We were doing uh, putting some vapor barriers down. So it, it works, but he does get paid. <laughs> <laughs> but he's learning right now. He's learning. But um, I think one of my biggest challenges with mistakes was the fact that not trusting your network. You're not good at everything. You can't be everywhere. I think um, Max was just saying that, you know, all of these little sites and stuff, you got them all written down? Because <laughs> um, cause I think the key things I lost, um, was it 80000 80000 There's a little more than 80000 on a deal because I didn't trust my network. I thought I could do it. And I went in here first and really got my tail cut. So um, that was talking about not good. Not actually properly using my attorney. I said I was going to just close the deal, run with it. And it was right down the street, right over here. And it didn't have to buy the house back out of foreclosure because I didn't trust my network and I signed a contract I shouldn't have signed. Right, right. Okay, she still beat that one. <laughs> but here's, here's the point of story. I didn't take no of my answer. That's the highest price house I paid for, but now it's, it's, it is well worth it. All right, so my biggest mistake, my, my biggest mistake was in my real estate career, uh, I, first, I bought my first house at 24 and I invested in real estate without learning about real estate. I was just always an action taker and I didn't read my first book until 26, which was the that I bought that. So when I bought that first house, um, we lost about seven grand a piece. So that was my biggest mistake and we did everything wrong. We, we basically, we wanted to flip the house, but we did all the steps wrong. So did you quit? I did not quit. I was too stupid to quit at that time. <laughs> I, I was in my 20s. I was young. And I needed that Bentley and 17 illegitimate children. <laughs> Fast forward, I still don't have a Bentley and I don't have any children. See how that works? It's great. So, but yeah. Um, in scaling, finding the right employees. You talked about how you spent a lot of money on all the different sites. I'd love to hear the insight on how you found the best employees. Um, so my 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 lead, my best employee right now, uh, Shannon. She's my lead salesperson. Um, I actually uh, bought a house from her, and uh, she she wanted to work for me for three months, and I didn't want her in the inside of knowing what we did. And she's she's the best one I got. But I've spent a lot of money going to sale training and hiring and recruiting. Uh, Go and spending money with gurus, probably thirty thousand, to figure out how to hire correctly. Um, but the hiring process, I fine tuned it. Um, I do group interviews now. I don't do one on one interviews. Um, and we really hire for um, not their current skills, but are they a trainable individual that that has a positive attitude. Um, you, you can't bring in somebody that feels like they're already there. Yeah, so you, you have to find somebody's culture. Um, so I think that's the best way. We do group interviews. We have, a, it's like a 30 minute pitch. Most people leave when I ask them if they want to be a part of it, they get out. Um, and I pay well. Um, we have health benefits and everything. So we, um, you know, when we, when we select, we really hire for, 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 for company culture and uh, are they a trainable individual? And, and uh, fire fast, yes. very fast. And I don't care if they're making you the most money possible. It's, it's one of the hardest things, because I'm like a passionate person, like I always see the good side, even in the, the worst individual. Um, and, and that person can bring down your entire team. Yeah. And, and I'm going through now, I'm, I'm putting uh, a new office, it's 8,000 square feet, and we're gonna put 75 <coughs> individuals in that office. Um, so that's why, I'm scared so fast. I see you guys run scale businesses, have a team, 
in regards to uh, your acquisitions, mm -hmm. the lead volume, the volume in general, when you feel this is a, this is a great time to add additional acquisitions for or so? Um, yeah, so when is the proper time to hire and scale? Um, Specifically acquisitions. Acquisitions, you're going to know. Uh, that's a quite, that's a common question. I asked that same question when I was when I was thinking I was ready. You'll know. You'll know because if you're keeping up with your KPIs, you'll know how many deals you miss by not having that extra person, and you can't handle the call volume or you can't go on enough appointments. It's going to be a telltale sign. You're just going to it's going to be a flash of red light. Hire more people now. Or or should I say, um, do you have like? For them to manage a certain amount of leads, like, hey, my target is to each rep manage a certain amount, or like, no, don't, don't, don't try to look at it like that because, like, it overcomplicates it. Like, I believe in trying to keep business simple, right? So, like, I, I don't try to put things into my space to like create more headaches because you're gonna deal with enough of that, like, period. What I can tell you from dealing with a lot of hiring over the years and a lot of mistakes in hiring over the years is like, have your scopes and processes like super tight for you ever think about hiring anybody. So like you should be able to hire someone and they come work for you, and you can sit them on a computer, and you've got training directly in front of them, and they can get out of the seat and know exactly what you want them to do as far as sales are concerned. Mm -hmm. So like any question you got in your business, you should be able to ask it when they get up, and they can come back to you and say, yeah, you know what, Max, I do this. Yeah, Naj, you know what, I do this. If, you, if you're not at a space where that's set up yet, then you're not ready to hire somebody to do your sales. The other side of that is, you gotta be in a spot in your business, especially with wholesaling, where you know, hey, if I spend X amount of dollars on marketing, it's gonna produce, at a minimum, X amount of deals, right? So if I spend 5,000, I know it's gonna give me two deals out of spending 5,000. You gotta know your KPIs, and it's gonna tell you that. So you gotta know, hey, all right, I spent 5,000 this month. At a bare minimum, I'm gonna get to at least two deals, right? And then you just start to turn that over and then you can insert somebody into that seat. But don't 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 jump the gun on trying to get somebody to do sales for you and that kind of deal. I agree with Max, like you gotta feel it inside of your business, you're gonna know. But have systems and processes set up so you can really insert somebody in there and can be successful. Because oftentimes what happens, we'll go to hire somebody, right? And we don't give them the training information and things that they need, and we look at them and say, Hey, you weren't successful, right? Like I gave you I gave you the job, you didn't do this, you didn't do that. It's really just us, right? Like, we're running around, we're doing all these different things, speaking places and doing this and doing that. At the end of the day, you have to set people up for success. If somebody's coachable and trainable and you see that on that initial interview, put them in a pathway for success. But you can't do that if you don't give them the information they need to be successful. All of my systems and processes are not documented online in a company. Uh, we use a software called Trainual. Trainual and everything. So if you get hired for this position, you get a login for that position, you watch all the videos, and you leave there, and you know exactly what you're supposed to do. Don't have and before you're thinking about hiring, like start setting that stuff up like right now. <laughs> right? Right. Like, make videos of how you do this. Yeah, how you do everything. That. How do you make your cold calls? How do you set up your mojo? Mm -hmm. Like how do you pull your list and list source? Like how you do everything? Like start setting that stuff up. <laughs> Tricky training will you said as well. Yeah, I've seen the ads, right? We use sweet processes. There's a bunch of different sites. It's called like an SOP site. So you look at different websites and you can create SOPs. But start doing that early in your business before you ever think about hiring. Me. I didn't do that and I regretted it because I had to go back to do it all right before I could be successful at trying to hire you. Scope of process, right? So you want to set those up, have those documented. You can do those inside of those websites and uh, it can really help you out a ton. What KPIs should you track? And then, like, how's those numbers look? What KPIs should you track, CJ, and how do those numbers look? So that's a loaded question, right? Because that's going to be across, like, multiple parts of your business. All right, so, like, I believe you got to isolate that down to specifics. So, like, when it comes to making offers, all right, uh, how many offers did you make? Was the offer accepted? Was the offer declined? And is it an impending situation? So if you've talked to sellers and been in that situation, we've all had the opportunity or the situation where you go talk to a seller and the seller says to you, yeah, I gotta talk to my attorney, right? Or hey, I gotta talk to my sister or whoever, right? So like that's a pending offer when it comes to us, right? The other thing is you wanna track out your calls. 
The reason I like Mojo is the reporting system inside Mojo makes it extremely simple to track that information and see what that looks like. So is your, if you got a VA like me that's making your phone calls, all right, so how long were they on the phone? What was their dead air time, right? Uh, how many contacts did they have? And how many, how many properties actually got pushed over? So isolate that down, everybody's KPI is gonna be different because what the outcomes that we want are all gonna be different. I may wanna make $100,000 a month, Max might wanna make $200,000 a month. I, I believe that, right? <laughs> Me too, Max. So, right, so you gotta, figure, you gotta figure that part out inside your business and reverse engineer all your KPIs to fit that. But please break that down to different parts of your business, right? You don't wanna know just like one part. You wanna know, all right, your sales guy, he asked about a sales guy earlier. All right, so how many appointments are you going on a week? How many did you get under contract? Like you wanna isolate those things down. That's how you truly start to track data. So he, he's right, and this is the point where you start to scale. And this is where it becomes very easy. At, at this point, once you know your KPIs, and for people that know KPIs, it means key performance indicators. It's very easy. So like if, if, you're, if your specialty is cold calling and you have somebody on the dialer, how many dials do you make? And then how many contacts do you have, right? And the ratio is probably gonna be the same. So let's just say if you make a thousand calls a day and you reach uh, 50 people, right? So out of those 50 people you talk to, how many people were interested in uh, an offer, right? So now you know, okay, two people were interested. So I spoke to, I dialed a thousand, talked to 50, two wanted an offer. I sent out an offer, none of them wanted, none of them accepted my offer. So now you have to figure out the KPI. So now it's like, okay, you, for the offer, you say, okay, how many appointments do I go on? Out of how many appointments, how many offers do I make out of those appointments? Out of how many appoint offers I make, how many are accepted? Out of every accepted deal, how much money is made from each deal? So when you start breaking that down, you start to see, then you can start saying, all right, I need five salespeople because I need to make 5,000 calls a day because I want to reach uh, 250 people a day because I know I'm going to send out, I'm going to know I'm going to go out on eight appointments and out of those eight appointments, I'm going to get two contracts. And out of those two contracts, I'm going to make $36,000. And now you say, okay, I have that in my business. Now I just need to turn up and spend more money. Right. And so instead of saying cold calling doesn't work anymore, yeah. now you're tracking that information. You know, I, I just got to increase my volume of calls because if we make, for every 300 calls we make, we get three contacts, right? So once you know that, now you know when that starts to drop, you just got to kick that up and keep tracking it. And you could, your, your business starts to get predictable. And then, you, and then you know where you need to improve, right? So if you say, okay, out of those um, eight, eight appointments we made, my sales guy was only able to get one contract. So then you start to think back and you start you need to analyze why. And then you say, my sales guy sucks. Fire him. You put in a new sales guy, out of eight appointments, he's getting three contracts, right? So now you know where the leakage is in your business. If you don't track your numbers, the, I, I spend hundreds of thousands of dollars to go to smarter people to tell me this shit. And I'm telling you, if you don't know your numbers, you don't know how to scale, right? So like when I walk into a business, right? I have, I have another business that does like six million a year. I said, how do I increase the numbers? How do I get more money? He says, do you know your numbers? He says, that's the only way you're gonna increase your number. You need to know your numbers. So if you don't know your numbers, you can never scale in this business. You need to know every dollar where it spends. Like for example, that's why we use tracking numbers. I bought four billboards in the city and ran a campaign for three months. Cost me $21,000. You know how much money I made? Zero dollars. Guess what I did not do the next month? Exactly, so now I knew because I had a tracking number and I got zero calls, literally zero calls. I had a miss, miss dial, I had a miss dial. <laughs> but if you don't track, you don't know, you're just out there aimlessly spending. That, I hope that helps you. So KPIs.